Are you recording? There you go. Good job, Colin. All right. Well, as Colin said, it's the latest edition of our Waterside Chat. I'm Tom, I am Tom Sadler, the network's deputy director, and I'll be your host today. Um, in June, I had the pleasure of spending time with these two ladies at the Capitol Hill Oceans Week in Washington, D.C., and they have been kind enough to come on and join us to uh, chat about the proposed um, marine sanctuary uh, in uh, the Bering Sea off uh, the coast of Alaska. Um, we, I am delighted to welcome uh, Marissa McCulloch, Director of the Office of Justice and Governance Administration for the Aleut Community of St. Paul Island. And you can correct me if I've screwed that up, Marissa. And then also Lauren Devine, Director of the Ecosystem Conservation Office for the Tribal Government of St. Paul Island. Again, correct me if I screwed that up, ladies. Um, before we get started, do a little bit of housekeeping here. If you have questions, put them in the chat. We'll do our best to get to them. Um, we are recording this chat, as you can tell, um, and we will have it available on our website, on YouTube, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, as soon as we can get it ready. And I will leave that to our talented uh, IT director of, of uh, logistics and, and magic, uh, Mr. Colin Delaney. So without further ado, uh, let's get started. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. So um, tell us a little bit about yourselves, you know, where you grew up, where you come from, you know, where you went to school, what you studied, that kind of stuff. And we'll start with Marissa uh, and then we'll go to Lauren. Okay. Where? Wow. That's like, so my whole life story basically in like 30 seconds. No, take your time. <laughs> take your time. We have, we have time today. <laughs> So yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, as Tom said, I'm Marissa Mikuliev, the director of the Office of Justice and Governance Administration for Alley Community of St. Paul Island. We are a federally recognized tribe out in the Bering Sea um, on the Pribilof Islands. I grew up on St. Paul. Um, my parents are still there. I, we go back every summer, my children and I do, every summer to spend the summer on St. Paul. Um, Grew up there until about ninth grade, and then I had to leave for boarding school, as do many rural Alaskan children, because we don't have high schools in rural Alaska, or we didn't when I was growing up. So I went to boarding school in Sitka, Alaska, um, which kind of per properly prepped me for college, I guess. Um, headed down to Arizona State when I was 16 and started my degree down there. And honestly, at 16 year old, who could make a real rational judgment about college? I just wanted to be in the sun. That was it. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go to the sunshine and headed to Arizona and thought I wanted to study marine biology and then realized I chose the middle of the desert and did not think that through in any way. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I got my bachelor's of science in conservation biology, um, spent a year with Ocean, what was Center for Marine Conservation and then Ocean Conservancy. The director then was like, why don't you go to law school? You don't have to be a lawyer. I was like, sure, I have nothing else to do. So went to law school and did environmental law and Indian law and just actually really loved it. Um, loved the whole practice of law and everything about it. Um, and from there, actually, I went to clerk in the Superior Court in Anchorage and decided it was too dark and cold and I wasn't ready yet. So I just up and moved to New Zealand um, after my clerkship was over got a tribe, just got a job with um, a tribe down there, just miraculously just teamed up with um, the White Waikato Tainui tribe who were just starting their negotiations with the British crown over the co-management of their ancest ancestral river. They wanted environmental management over their river. And it was like everything I could dream about in a job um, and worked for them for a year and help build this co-management structure over the most commercially utilized river in New Zealand, but that they saw as an ancestor. Um, and then from there, came back, worked at GoDaddy for a year as intellectual property counsel. I have no idea why my friend was general counsel. She said, come work for us. So I did. Um, and then finally made my way back to working for St. Paul. So in this really long roundabout way, I started college with the intention of coming back to actually run the eco office um, and then kind of took a long path and ended up in governance and working with our 
president on our government to government relationships with the federal government, um, really fighting for our sovereignty, working on big policy stuff, which I am really enjoying. But uh, yeah, that's kind of how my life path went and wandered and got all kinds of experience. But yeah, here I am now. And luckily did not become eco director because we have Lauren in that position, which is perfect and probably a good transition to Lauren. It's a beautiful Absolutely. segue. What a wonderful <laughs> segue. No, no wonder you're you're so respected in your field. <laughs> yes. Hi, Lauren. Um, hello. So I'm Lauren Devine, and um, I'm originally from Savannah, Georgia, a little actually barrier island called Tybee Island in Savannah, but I've spent equal parts of my life in Georgia. Texas and um, now Alaska. So I uh, completed an undergraduate degree in wildlife and fisheries management. I wanted to work in fisheries uh, at Texas a and I went to graduate school at, back in Georgia, and then I really wanted to work in the Northwest uh, on salmon fisheries, and I moved um, up to Fairbanks, Alaska after being offered a fellowship to go to uh, graduate school at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I didn't get to work on salmon. I didn't get to, you know, work in the Pacific Northwest, but I got a, a program that allowed me to work with snow crabs in the Arctic, a really popular and um, high value commercial fishery up here in Alaska. And through my graduate program, I got to intern with the Aleut community of St. Paul Island in St. Paul. And after my first year of classes in Fairbanks, I went out to the island. I lived there with my young daughter uh, and fell in love with the community, with the people. I just, um, the education I was receiving was to really become an interdisciplinary scientist. And I just felt um very honored to be able to use my skill set for the tribal government, and uh, I have been there ever since. So I direct the Ecosystem Conservation Office. Thank you, Marissa, for letting me have that position. <laughs> um, I've been with the tribe for 10 years now in that department, wow. and um, I, I like to coin a, a term from a colleague and say I'm a recovering scientist. So I get to do scientific research and monitoring on St. Paul but I also get to work across fisheries management, policy and management. Um, I get to advocate for the tribe. I get to work with others in academia and industry and agencies um, and, and uh, even do education and outreach. So we span many different disciplines in what we do and, and every day is different. Um, but by and large, I get to use the skills uh, and interests and passions that I have for the tribal government to help um, advanced self-determination, self-sovereignty, or sovereignty, excuse me, um, and, and just advance the vision, mission, goals of the tribal government. Well, that's fantastic. Um, obviously, as our listeners can, can tell, we have two extremely talented and highly qualified ladies um, to tell us a little bit about this um, sanctuary nomination. Um, I will let you two decide who speaks on what, but um, uh, last year, um, the Aleut community um, submitted a nomination. The nomination has been, I may get these terms a little bit off, um, accepted. So it's in a process. Um, now for a National Marine Sanctuary, and here's where I, um, get nervous because I will probably butcher the name. Um, Alagum Canoe. How did Canoe. I do? Pretty good. Alagum Canoe. Yep. Canoe. Okay. Close. Well, I may fall back on Heart of the Ocean, which is what... Uh, which is I, I do too, Tom, all the time. We can't okay. be colonized. We can't speak our language very well either. So... Well, totally fine to say heart of the ocean. <laughs> as you can tell, uh, my background, I'm in Virginia. So mm -hmm. it's like that's, and I'm a Yankee in Virginia. So my language skills are suspect anyway. So so help, when I get off on the wrong pronunciation, do not hesitate to correct me. But um, so I, I was reading through the nomination. There was a little footnote about uh, the name. Is it still... I have, have has the tribal government well explain that a little bit did there was some discussion about maybe coming to a, a community de decision on the name which i thought was interesting that it was that kind of community discussion on the naming of it 
So I guess I'll kind of start. Lauren is amazing at explaining the science of our proof ecosystem um, and all of that details and why we were in the in we got made it into inventory. But I can kind of maybe explain the the background to all of it um, and who we are as a people. Um, we do have the and I'm Lauren knows better stats as well. But we're the largest breeding ground for northern fur seals. The history of our people is we're were brought to the Pribilofs actually to harvest the fur seals first by the Russians, then by the Department of Commerce or NOAA, um, who, when the US bought Alaska, which they actually bought Alaska because of the Pribilof Islands because of the fur seal trade. So our really? people have just been, yeah, most people don't know that about Alaska. Wow. That is why that a US purchased Alaska was the fur trade was just so profitable out there in the Pribilof Islands. And the labor was free because our people were slaves. Um, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me step back. Um, it, I, this is news to me. So, so <laughs> your folks, the, the, your ancestors were slaves. Walk they me were through that a little bit. Under so when Russia came over and discovered the discovered um, the Aleutian chain. Um, and then the first seals on the Pribilofs that we had otters there at the time and probably a bunch of other marine mammals. Um, they brought up labor from the Aleutian chain, the Alu people, to the Pribilofs to harvest the fur seals and do all of the hard work. I mean, that's what colon colonization is, right? Utilizing the indigenous people to, to do the hard stuff. Um, so that was, we were slaves under the Russian government, and then the U.S. purchased it and just purchased the Aleuts like any commodity um, and wow. slaved our people for, and I, we were, we were, turned into wards of the federal government, but it was actually 1983 when the federal government pulled out of the Pribilof. So in my lifetime, I was a child when the US federal government finally pulled out of commercial harvesting um, and left their presence, the Department of Commerce and NOAA left the islands. So wow. yes, wow. we have a very long history with, with the federal government and particularly the Department of Commerce, which is ironic because that's who we're with now for the sanctuary process, but. Um, yeah, that's just like a really condensed version of our history. We have this whole World War II internment where our people were removed from the Pribilof Islands during World War II in very harsh, horrible conditions. Um, we're just dumped off in Southeast Alaska and broken down canneries, no water, no heat. no. And so there's just a lot of horrific things that went on for our people um, under the being wards of the federal government and Department of Commerce. But with that being said, that is really what drives the way we're approaching this sanctuary process. For us as a people, we were not about, let's do a marine sanctuary because we don't even like the word sanctuary, which is why we have the Aleute name for it. Um, that's how it came about because we think of sanctuary like a lot of people do. It's a trigger word, like you just lock off the ocean and Noah comes in and controls everything. That's how our people saw it. Um, so it was kind of, it, we're going through a learning process, a very gentle one, but our first step was to come up with a name in Aleut, um, that, where we wouldn't have to call it a sanctuary. So that was just so appropriate, heart of the ocean, because we are in middle of the largest fishing grounds right now, I think on the, probably on the planet, as far as what's going on in the Bering Sea, um, very profitable billions of dollars of industry going on, but right in the middle of where we are. We really are the heart of the Bering Sea. Um, so that's how we came about the name. And we went really quickly into submitting our nomination. So we didn't have time to, um, especially during COVID, travel out to the community and really interact in the way we wanted to on the on the ground level of you know word mapping and because we aren't fluent in Aleut anymore, trying to figure out you know the right Aleut words to use for for things about our ecosystem, um, we haven't been able to properly do that with our community. So we just kind of quickly talked to some of the elders who do know Aleut um, and different ideas for the sanctuary and came up with Alagum Kano, which is heart of the ocean, um, which just seemed very fitting. But we do, of course, want this to be a community decision. How do we feel? Because it's a community ecosystem. It, it's our people, we're a part of it, and we want everybody to feel connected to that. But at the same time, we want the outside to feel connected as well. We want the fishing industry to feel connected. We want the world to feel connected. So we did choose 
a term that was easier to say um, and had a lot of meaning to it. And that's how we came about that name. And, and it'll probably stick. I think we've all come accustomed to saying it and, and it's really- it, Some it, of it, us have come accustomed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have to say, especially in the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries um, within NOAA, it's 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 becoming kind of common to be able to say Alagum Kano um, when referring to our sanctuary nomination. So maybe our people will want to keep it, but it really is up to the people at the end of the day. Well, I'm going to let Lauren talk, but I did want him to to note two things here in what you were just saying is that one, the the I'm impressed with the the um, interaction that you're having with your history um, and that that whole um, you know, being respectful and, res and and responsive and and recognizing that the community has uh, an important voice in this and I, that's not always been the case in in some of my experience with with either national monuments or um, where, you know, it's not, I don't want to say edicts, but it's, you know, you've got a very different approach and we'll, we may come back to that in, in a bit. And again, I want to um, acknowledge that uh, the history of this location is, is particularly significant. And obviously I didn't know about it until we were talking about it now. And it's in, in and I think that's a uncomfortable thing to know, but it's an important thing to know. So I appreciate you you helping us understand that a little bit more. And um, okay, Lauren, uh, you know, the, let's hear let's hear your views here. Oh goodness. I'm not sure what else I can add to that, but I guess I'll speak to the to the values a little bit. Um, you know, th this was very important for our community to drive the action of the nomination. And you'll see in the nomination, there are Unangan values. Um, Unangan is people of the seeds. Aleut is the term that, that Russians um, used for people um, of the islands and of the Aleutian chain. And so we have the values right up in front. And um, that goes hand in hand with having the community take the lead in uh, determining the name and coming to consensus around the name Alagum Kano um, or some other name as we advance this process, but it's the the wording and the values very much underpin how we got to a sanctuary in the first place, which is, um, you know, Marissa and myself and a, a team of very talented tribal, you know, leaders and support staff came together and, and partners, external partners to, to our tribal government, you know, came together and looked at the regulations, the federal code, the laws that exist. Um, and it was to answer long standing, decades long um, concerns from the community around population declines. Northern fur seal are declining at a very high rate, um, as Marissa said. Aleut people were brought to the Pribilofs. Um, they were not permanently inhabited until Russians uh, forcibly brought and enslaved uh, Unangan to um, harvest fur seals. But now there is this inextricable connection um, between the communities and the fur seal. And there are connections to the resources of the area, to crab, to halibut, to cod, to um, octopus and um, everything, seabirds. Uh, yes, just everything octopus. in- in the marine ecosystem um, and it, the, the sights, the smells, the experiences, you know, the traditions, the, the activities, they're all so connected that it was really important for us to present the values and to use the language to become more comfortable in that as we are using federally, um, you know, what exists in federal regulation to try and form that to something that will advance our goals around local management and um, self-determination. And, and we've achieved that in the nomination to set forth and request a co-management. And I know we'll get to that um, in a little bit, but that really, to me, just sets St. Paul apart in the vision of whole ecosystem stewardship and using tribal values and the indigenous perspectives that 
have, you know, inhabited Alaska before Alaska was its name, you know, the lands and waters um, of this area. And, and it just, to me, is such a powerful example of um, what is possible with this kind of vision and leadership coming from a tribe, you know, that's sitting in the heart of the ocean, you know, in the heart of the Bering Sea. No wonder you're a great communicator. I see what you did there. That was really good. And also, you led me into my next question, which was um, the nomination does articulate some of those values of the uh, of, of the indigenous people. Um, can you articulate those for folks who haven't read the nomination, although it's prominent in there, what those uh, values are in, in English for us? And I bet Lauren actually can say them in Alu because Lauren has done, I think one of the best parts about Lauren coming on is she's really taken the time to, to learn the, the language, um, you know, learn how to say things much more so than, than most of us have growing up on the island. Um, and so there is, we do have kind of a list of um, Unungan values that we just, we did put down onto paper, but for us are just common sense almost like if for that's how it feels to us right like this is common sense why would we have to write it down but apparently we do because it is not the way that all non-indigenous people necessarily approach um the environment because for us everything is connected um we haven't even touched on the, the economy part of it but that is a huge driving force behind all of this but for the values itself if we want to like really dive into those um what they say specifically and the value. I am going to let Lauren do that because I know she's actually very eloquent on on saying them. Um, so awesome. Say well, it, but Lauren, for the for this uh, for us ignorant <laughs> ones, um, if you will, if 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 you'll translate them for us, and I don't want to spend a lot of time, but I think it's important to set the stage for the uniqueness of this nomination. Um, so. Without further ado, I'll I'll let you articulate in a nungan. Uh, I will do my best. Um, I cannot speak all of uh, the words of all of the values that we put forth because we do have um, a, a handful that we put forth. But um, I, I will uh, do the do best. Do what makes I you comfortable. And I, I'll say um, two of the values are tuman tana agli saktan tuman alagu agli saktan, and that is take care of the land and take care of the ocean. Um, you'll see that articulated in different ways in some of the other values. Um, for instance, one is alagum aglikladaku, which is the ocean is to be protected. And um, there is one that's inclusive that means live with and respect the land, sea, and all nature. I'm not gonna try that one because I will butcher it, but I one of my favorites, um, since I've started working with the tribal government is this idea of kakamika, uh, which is subsistence. And one of our values um, is subsistence is sustenance for life. And that word subsistence has become very loaded in Alaska in particular. The state of Alaska has very um, narrow definitions and, and contradictory to indigenous values and indigenous definitions of subsistence. And so that one in particular um, rings true, especially as we uh, navigate this idea of, uh, of protecting the ocean the, and taking care of the lands, the water, the air, uh, everything within the ecosystem. And so Marissa, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. I gave it my best shot. You did great. <laughs> that was way better than I could do. So it sounded great. <laughs> well, it's, it's, um, I think sharing those helps us understand beyond just the, hey, here's a couple of islands on the map and, you know, we want to protect them. Um, the, the reasoning behind this nomination is in captured, at least for me, when I read those, uh, in those values. So I, I thought they were particularly um, important and, and, I, and I, I love the ones that you picked out. So. And I think it's important to note that, you know, these, these are indigenous values. You do not have to be indigenous to understand or let them resonate with you or follow them. That's for, um, for sure. And, and that to me was really important to communicate as a non-indigenous person and working for a, a tribal government. You know, I, 
want to make sure that we understand as non-Indigenous peoples that that we can abide by and, you know, take these in, reflect on them and follow them. And that is really important um, when we're talking about these kinds of efforts and gaining attention on the national stage is that um, you don't have to be Indigenous to, to respect and follow Indigenous values. It's something we can all, um, you know, advocate for and, and live our lives by. Well, and I think those indigenous values are, as you say, are, they're not. You don't have to be indigenous to understand the importance of those that's that's encapsulated in those <clears throat> values, especially the ones you articulated. Um, I want to get into the 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 other fascinating part about this is the co-management and the economics of that. So, if we can talk a little bit, it's a a unique uh, proposal in this co-management and. Um, rather than me explain it, I'll leave it to the experts to go ahead and tell us what that means in terms of this nomination. So I think there's probably a way to piece it out on um, what it means kind of at the high level and then everybody what it means in the detail, like co-management of what. Um, for us, I think we entered into co-management is not an option. It's an absolute must or it's that we we don't want a sanctuary is is our is where we stand in St. Paul. And it's because of the history that I just that I laid out so quickly mm -hmm. is that we absolutely cannot accept any more NOAA control of our islands in any way. In any way. So it has to be co-management at its true core, which for us is an actual partnership. It's a team. Um, we live in reality. We know NOAA's not going to go away. The federal government's not going away. We have to work with them. This is their jurisdiction, but we should be working with them as equal partners, as you know, as a fairly recognized tribe is with a, the a Department of the Federal Government. We are equal partners, um, and that is has to be the approach to this sanctuary, or else we don't want it at all. And on a call yesterday with NOAA, they asked, well, what does co-management mean? It means something different, how it plays out for you know, different different people, different tribes, different. It, it could mean a lot of things. But for us, it means that anything where NOAA has the final say to the very smallest thing, to the very biggest thing, that's not co-management, right? It has to be consensus decision-making. It has to be something we are truly doing together, not just the way that tribes have always been. You know, we consulted with the tribe. Yeah, they don't like it, but let's just move on. Let's just pursue it. But that is why we are proposing co-management and why it has to be co-management just because of our history with NOAA we just cannot not take the risk of even the best intentions of oh no don't worry we're going to come out there we're going to you know do the best we can for your community no no and just no we're not interested in just a sanctuary we really really have to have that equal voice, the management over the area. And it does include an economy, um, but not in the way I think that most people are scared about when they hear about a sanctuary in the Bering Sea. We are not proposing co-management over commercial fishing. That is one of the things we made a decision right up front. Sanctuaries can put fisheries into um, their sanctuary plan and, and work with commercial fisheries. We do not want to touch it. And that is just, you know, we are, again, we're, we're realists. We're in the middle of the Bering Sea. They're billion dollars industry. We're not interested in managing those commercial fishing or touching them in any way. We want to make very clear the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, who, who does have that authority, that stays with them. That is not what we're after in the sanctuary is management of commercial fishing. Um, what we really want to do, what we need out there in the Bering Sea is, you know, when, when the government pulled out, they were, you know, we harvested fur seals, they pulled out, they're like, okay, go be fishermen. So we have a halibut commercial fish, commercial halibut fishing industry that we do that sustains us. And then of course, we have a lot of revenue coming in from the crab industry, from Pollock, from all of those big industries occurring around the island. Um, they come into our island, they dock there, we get taxes, we have a trident plant. We are tied to that commercial fishing. We have no interest in just stopping that. But I think we do have an interest in making sure those things succeed too, that they, they're sustainable, that they come, like especially with the crab crash, we wanna see that come back. We rely heavily on that crab fishing industry. We aren't directly fishing it, but we they do come in, they deliver there. We need them to succeed as well. Um, and so that's why 
I think we're doing this a little differently. So yes, we want to co-manage equally, but we're not talking about co-management of commercial fishing, which is this scare for everyone. We really want to diversify our economy, make it stable, um, and direct the way that the economy does grow. And for us, it's through the sanctuary, it would be research is our main thing, ecotourism. Um, I know Lauren has kind of a long list of ideas that she wants to see play out to help boost the economy through the ecosystem. Um, but that is kind of the basics of co-management. It is just very equal with the federal government, um, but not co-management over everything in the ecosystem. Co-management just defines that how we are gonna partner and work together. Um, and then the sanctuary process will define what those resources are that we're gonna co-manage. But we've been very clear, it's not gonna be commercial fishing resources. That is not what we're after. And Lauren, do you wanna add to kind of your view of building this up? Please, I want to hear her list. Oh, okay. oh well, uh, not related to co-management, more related oh. to um, building what the sanctuary, you know, can be in the future. But I, I guess in in the co-management vein, I think Marissa painted it um, very accurately, and and that it is it's an absolute must. Um, you know, th that is something the tribal government um, needs an assurance from the federal government. I love the idea of co-management of the ecosystem, though, because um, while we would like for, um, you know, fisheries management to, to be maintained under the, the process of the North Pacific Fishery Management Council, which is our regional, you know, advisory council, um, it's not to say that we are not involved in that process. We have been and, and are involved in that process in a very meaningful way, in an active way. Um, and this council has uh, approved and adopted ecosystem-based fisheries management. Something like a co-managed uh, sanctuary around the Pribilof Islands is a, is a perfect uh, kind of example or view into that ecosystem-based management versus, you know, very single species-based management. And um, that gives a, a, a very nice, open, you know, uh, transparent conversation that, that meshes with what the Fisheries Management Council um, has uh, you know, taken as as their mission to to look towards this ecosystem based fisheries management, and so um, it's it's been really interesting to think about how those uh, would interact, but also acknowledging that fisheries management has a process in Alaska, and that is the process that our tribal governments have um, chosen with regards to a sanctuary. You know, if and when designated as as the appropriate mechanism, um, as a process that we're already engaged in. And we, I, we, I can move into my laundry list of hopes and dreams, but. Um, <laughs> well, sure. This, I, I would love to hear that. Um, I'd also like to, to sort of have you guys um, fill in or, 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 or break down a little bit more of the economic importance for the community on this, uh, with this, with this sanctuary. So if those two tie together, have at it. Um, yeah, absolutely they do. And Marissa, I don't know if you want me to start or you want to take it. Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, we do have a lot of interest in seeing uh, economic diversification in the Pribilofs. I think there's a lot of um, untapped potential and, and areas for expansion. Marissa mentioned that we're halibut fishing community. So we operate a long line, uh, small boat fleet uh, that is long lining for halibut. Um, and there are certainly species in the ecosystem, we have snow crab, we have red king crab. Uh, one species we have is the purple off island blue king crab. And we have partnered with um, partners like the university and Sea Grant program, as well as industry and agency to look at purple off island blue king crab because it's declined. It was declared overfished. Um, that stock has not been rebuilt. It has not recovered and it's longstanding um, decline and low population level can actually trigger closures in other fisheries. So catching one blue king crab, two blue king crab as bycatch um, can shut down a whole fishery. And so there's a huge, you know, impact to industry for that, but there's also the community impacts to that because fisheries that are landed or fisheries are landing catch and processing on St. Paul and a huge tax base for us um, is commercial fishing. And so um, we would really like to be able to have a strong voice and active 
um, leadership in habitat research, in species research, like Purple Off Island Blue King Crab. Um, we have a strong foundation for that because we've been part of a group that's been looking at um, the feasibility of outstocking, kind of rearing blue king crab, um, taking females from the wild and harvesting those eggs, rearing them into young juveniles and outplanting them again to increase survival. And that has huge implications for um, protecting and increasing quotas and in fisheries into the future. Um, and we have a lot of, of potential research and uh, you know, management ideas like that, that could be realized that have a basis of, of scientific and, and, uh, you know, different ways of knowing type support behind them. Uh, tourism is a huge area that at right now, at present, we get a lot of birders, people that are in the area looking for uh, exotic species um, to check off bird lists um, that they've seen. However, we have, um, you know, whale watching, scuba diving, um, boat building is a tradition on St. Paul wow. and St. George that um, the traditional kayak, it called the Ikya, uh, and bidar, bidars or bidarkas were used to um, go in between the islands and they were seal, uh, seal or sea lion skin boats. There is a range of opportunities. You know, we have been exploring mariculture and we have all of these ideas around blue economy and um tourism and cultural and maritime heritage that um, can be realized with um, the resources and capacity that come with, with something like a sanctuary designation. And I'll let Marissa add um, to that. We could talk forever. So in the interest of time, I'll let her like get the Maybe big- Maybe highlight some of the more important. So we kind of see our sanctuary nomination. Um, there's, it's as a three-legged stool. So we have the economics, we have the conservation, which of course we haven't touched on much, but our first seals need something to happen. Um, and then the co-management. So the other thing, you know, what we had something really cool that just happened was the, um, we obviously being the middle of Bering Sea, we used to have a Coast Guard Loran station out there that kind of went down to bare bones. We actually just got the commandant of the Coast Guard back out there a couple of weeks ago. Um, and looking at that base again and, and hopefully bringing the Coast Guard presence back. And that is the way even for us, we see the sanctuary working with that because the Coast Guard has a lot of Arctic research, Arctic interests, a lot of stuff that they want to see. And they can kind of see how something that we're trying to build a research center, um, our safety boat, a lot of the resources we have can, can aid in what their plans are for the Arctic. Um, we want to get broadband out there. It's a really big thing for us where we got to lay that cable across the ocean floor. So for us, this sanctuary has to be extremely flexible and absolutely driven from the local view and the ground up because all of those complexities we just laid out, only we on St. Paul know all those complexities, right? And are able to see it in a way that can fit together um, in a total workable, flexible package. And so, yeah, it's... We, got a, we have a lot of promise out there, um, and this was kind of just one way to bring it all together and maybe streamline some of those some of those things that we want to do. Awesome. Um, so I'll take us you you again, you guys do such a great job. You just fed me the question. So talk a little bit about the conservation values. So oh, the conservation yeah, goals, yeah. The, the one thing that I think, you know, as we're we're talking about a sanctuary in Alaska, which there is none in the middle of the fishing grounds, um, we always seem to focus a lot on the economics and the not doing commercial fishing. But obviously, um, conservation was at the heart of this, the needs of our fur seals and how quickly they are declining. Um, and our, our people have seen it for a long time, along with a lot of our other species. Um, the numbers are probably horrifying and more and probably can say them off the top of her head. But um, something has to be done, right? We all know like something has to be done for us. We do not, absolutely do not want an Endangered Species Act listing. Like that's the last thing that we would like to see happen for our fur seals because of everything I just said. We mm -hmm. need economy out there. We need to commercial fish our halibut. Um, we want to lay broadband, we want the Coast Guard, we want all these things to happen. And if we did an ESA listing, that could, you know, we don't have control of that process in any way. That's not a co-management process. That yeah, is for sure. across the board government process. 
Um, but it is coming to the point that something has got to be done for our fur seals. Um, and, and some of our elders say maybe it's even too late, but um, with all that's going on in there, there's that was really the heart of what started this is, okay, the fur seals are in big, big trouble, as are now a lot of the other species. What are we going to do? And this was the idea that we came up with, but I want Lauren to maybe talk about more of that conservation, because this is really where ECO spends a lot of the time, you know, looking at the research, the numbers, um, what's needed for our species. Yeah, and so we are about um, less than a quarter of the historic maximum. So um, we are talking going from something close to 2 million fur seals wow. uh, down to less than 500,000. And St. Paul Island has an order of magnitude higher um, number of pups that are born, that the number of fur seals that come back to St. Paul in particular, um, when we're talking, um, you know, what's in the Pacific, we have a, a breeding rookery on St. George Island. It's about 40 miles south. Um, it's an, another inhabited community, Unangan, um, you know, part of the same shared history of, of slavery. And the number of animals there is in the tens of thousands, where we have the hundreds of thousands on St. Paul. There's also Bogoslav Island, which is an uninhabited island um, north of the Aleutian mm -hmm. chain, so south of us. Very different habitat, very different uh, foraging environment. So where fur seals are going to feed, how they're feeding, what they're eating is very different. Um, and that's again, tens of thousands of fur seals. And then there's a lot that we don't know about some Russian uh, rookeries for obvious reasons. Um, not a lot of, of data sharing. <laughs> <laughs> from um, from Russian rookeries, but by and large, St. Paul is known as the world's um, largest breeding population of, of fur seals. And seeing the fur seals decline, I've seen it in my 10 years of St. Paul. Um, Marissa's seen it in her lifetime. Our elders have certainly seen it as the ones that were harvesting in the commercial harvest and living, you know, day in and day out with fur seals, understanding uh, when they occupy the island. Um, so they're not there year round, they migrate. Uh, that means they're leaving out the Aleutian chain where we have huge numbers of um, vessel vessels transiting through the area, bringing goods and services you know, to Alaska and to the Pacific Northwest, huge ports, um, the Great Circle route, you know, it shares a migration corridor with our fur seals. Uh, we have climate change impacts that are impacting um, where prey are found, how and when fur seals are migrating and using different areas. We have currents that are um, that are really our our pups are dependent on favorable currents because they don't have strong swimming abilities. And so when fur seals leave the island, those very young animals are quite vulnerable to um, you know the the winds and and currents of the North Pacific and um, you know this is one species we focus on northern fur seals because this is a um, what I would call a keystone species you know this is with, without northern fur seals the the cultural identity of the Pribilof Islands um, is missing its center it's kind of keystone. And um, we do know that there are climate change impacts that are going to take a long time to address that are probably impacting fur seals. Um, but we also know that foraging and finding enough food in the, in the right places is an issue. Um, that's, uh, I don't think, a, a secret to anyone, it, you know, that that knows about fur seals and about what they eat and um, knows anything about their prey species. However, um, the solutions to how to recover fur seals, which again is another long-term question for recovery, is something that requires everyone to come together around and everyone to come up with some creative and workable solutions, acknowledging that we have a range of activities, we have a range of stakeholders, a range of um, you know, uses of the Bering Sea and its resources, and we need to all come together to figure out a way um, to help those be sustained in the future. Uh, and that includes a, allowing for the recovery of northern fur seals. And so some of these obvious, um, we are not asking to take over the fisheries management process. However, there will be certainly um, potential management actions in the future that, that collectively we would like to bring to an open and transparent table uh, with those that we work with, with those that we um, interact with at the Fisheries Management Council and through 
our, you know, appointed council bodies to come up with some of those solutions. And so having a sanctuary and having co-management at the, at the governance core of that really um, provides an equitable seat and voice for the tribal governments that are stewarding and you know culturally dependent on these resources like Northern Fur Seal to be a part of that conversation and to drive those solutions with partners in the area, with stakeholders in the area, with, you know, the state of Alaska and the federal government. And this provides that opportunity to really um, strip away everything around Northern Fur Seals in particular, which is our priority, you know, resource um, to, to focus around for the sanctuary and, um, and be able to allow those conversations to happen in a timely manner, because as Marissa said, our elders have said it before and continue to say that it, it might already be too late for first. Mm -hmm. That would be uh, obviously a tragedy. And um, it's, it is, I'm delighted that you were able to share with us the, that, that conservation side of it. Um, so if I, it, it, I'm going to wrap up here and if I, if I can, articulate three things from 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 this conversation or about this nomination is one it's the co-management two it's the economic importance of of this area and and having this area um protected for those for those economic reasons and three that there is an important conservation element to this whether it's um just it's not just fur seals but there are other elements to that did i get it right did i get it pretty pretty much where 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 we should be yes except that we don't use the word protected either just like we don't okay. use sanctuary only because it's one again like the trigger sure, i know it's a trigger yeah. word, right um it is yeah but yes that's absolutely right that's like the three the three prongs to our stool economics conservation and co-management um awesome yes because I say, I just say, don't protect, connect. That was my saying at Chow, right? <laughs> like, that's yep. like, I'm, that's going to be our new. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, because we want to keep everything connected in a way that we, so we don't have to lock any users out, including ourselves, right? So that's, thank that's you. The way that um, I'm glad you clarified for our audience because I would have made a hash out of that as I did. So, <laughs> um, ladies, I want to thank you. You've done a terrific job of explaining this, especially enlightening. I hope our our listeners to the to the the history, um, the connections, um, and the future here. Um, what what happens next in the process? So that is a good question, right? Because of the politics. So we are working on maybe doing something a little bit different. We want to get kind of co-management protocols about the relationship up front and almost on paper from the federal government, not just their word they're going to engage in co-management relationship. Um, we want to see that um, before, we, before we push to move into designation, which is a almost purely political process. But yeah, that desic scoping and designation where, of course, everybody then comes back to the table um, is what we would we would hope to see. But we before we get there as IU people, we want to see from the federal government their commitment to moving forward in a co-managed way. Good for you. However that plays out. Good for you. Good for you. Bravo. Um, Anything else you want to share with us? If not, I'll take us out and and uh, just add again my thanks for 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 a lovely time at Chow in June. Um, it was it was a delight to meet you both and spend some time learning about this, learning about you. Uh, I'm thrilled that you came on the show today. Um, anything else you want to? share with us just if anybody wants more information our website's alute.com super easy to remember right alute.com everything's up there the nomination the about the travel government everything um as as well as contact information if anybody wants more or talk about this further but yes thank you. we had a both. great time at chow as apparent by the picture you chose for the <laughs> registration link <laughs> um yeah well that's it, it, it you do my work for me you know it was you gave me a photo to work with that showed off your your beautiful my beautiful guests and then you not then did exactly what i was forgot to do which was say how can you get more information so lauren anything else from you 
No, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I'm I'm so excited to um, share with everyone here and uh, whoever might watch this. And thank you for allowing us this time. Great. Well, the the uh, the ever talented uh, my producer, Mr. Colin Delaney, is here. And I think with that, I will say thank you, and we will uh, say goodbye. <laughs>